Todd Lotterella is the uh, executive director for the Missouri and Kansas chapter of the American Concrete Paving Association. He's been the, uh, in the pavement, engineering, and transportation field for his entire 26-year career. Prior to his present position, he spent five years as a state pavement engineer for the Kansas Department of Transportation. And prior to holding that position, Todd spent some time as a bridge engineer, a bridge designer, and pavement design engineer at KDOT. He has a Bachelor of Science degree in Civil Engineering from the University of Vermont and a Master's in Civil Engineering from the University of Kansas. Todd has been a registered PE in the state of Kansas since 1993 and Missouri since 2001. Todd is a member of the American Society of Civil Engineers and Chi Epsilon National Engineering Honor Society and is also involved with a number of other national and local associations. In 2008, Todd was awarded the prestigious ACPA Outstanding Promoter Award for his concrete pavement promotion efforts in Missouri and Kansas. Todd currently resides in Olath, Kansas, which is near here. Close by. Close by. Olathe. Olathe, with his wife Erin and 16-year-old daughter Sophia and 14-year-old daughter Isabella. So Todd's going to talk about concrete pavement preservation. Okay. Look at All right, thank you. Appreciate the opportunity to be here today. As he mentioned, I'm, I'm local here, so uh, my disclaimer for the presentation is it's not mine, like the previous speaker, so, uh, um, but I guess being the local representative for the industry, they thought it would be better for me to give the talk, which is interesting because in a few weeks I'm going to Minnesota to be their out-of-town expert up there, so I think I'm just being taken advantage of. I'm, I'm pretty sure of that, so. Um, and as I was uh, preparing for this talk, I was, I was trying to make this uh, more exciting, but it, it is difficult sometimes to, on these general overviews to uh, bring a lot of excitement in, but I'll try to uh, uh, embellish or bring my own thoughts into the presentation as we go. Um, what I've been asked to talk about is our new uh, updated uh, concrete pavement preservation guide. So everybody's excited about finally talking about concrete today, right? I know the crowd's gotten smaller, but I know you guys are dedicated and interested in concrete, so I'm, I'm glad to hear it. All right, the course developers are the, the folks that were involved in developing the updated guide. Of course, our national center, Concrete Pavement Technology Center up at Iowa State University, uh, federal highway involvement, as well as uh, DOT representatives involved in developing the course, as well as uh, industry folks such as folks like myself in the association business that do the concrete pavement promotion and our, our member companies that actually do the work. And you see there, Kurt Smith with Applied Pavement Technology and Dale Harrington with the CP Tech Center kind of spearheaded the effort. All right, that's not working, so we'll go. All right, so why concrete pavement? Well, we're not really here to talk about that, but uh, and in the interest of time, we'll just limit it to uh, the hallmark of concrete pavement is long life. So certainly these preservation techniques fit right into what we'd like to do is extend the life and the functionality of our concrete pavement products for as long as we can. Um, you can see these are 1890s vintage concrete pavements that are still out there. I'll show you a shot in a minute here. I'm not sure what that turning arrow is for. Point out the car or something, I don't know. but. Um, you see there, there's a picture, uh, a recent picture of the street. It has had some concrete pavement preservation rehabilitation done to it, but it's still in service and it's 122 years old. Um, and I think really the emphasis now on um, doing more with less, you know, I know in my two states that I work in, Kansas and Missouri, we have some significant funding issues uh, upon us and looming ahead. And so we're, at, we're being asked to really extend the life of pavements much more than we have in the past. There also appears to be an emphasis, which I'm not real excited about, and I don't know why this has happened, but to build things cheaper up front. So we're being asked to, uh, when I worked at the DOT in the 90s, we really focused on building the longest life products we could. And uh, it seems to me that's kind of gone away. Um, I think the funding folks and the politicians have got in there and told us, hey, you guys need to do more with less, find uh, ways to more economically build your pavement. So with that in mind, we're not building things with this kind of safety factors we did in the past. So the reality is these, these type of techniques are going to be more important. We're going to be using them more often, probably earlier, to make sure we extend the life of these pavements at least to where we expect them to, the life to be and beyond that. So um, like I said, I'm not a big fan of that, but that just seems to be the emphasis these days. 
All right, another yellow arrow, so I'm not sure what that is either, but we'll move on. All right, presentation outline, uh, just an introduction to pavement preservation, concrete pa pavement preservation guide, just give you a real brief overview. We won't have a lot of time to go into the details here. Uh, the contents and highlights really showing you what's been updated since the last, I think it's 2008, but since the last version of the publication. And then the status and future plans. Since I didn't really converse with anybody or the person that developed the talk, I'll kind of make stuff up at the end. But uh, I, think, I think I know what they're talking about. All right, so, I mean, we really covered a lot of these things through the other talks, whether it's asphalt or concrete. Um, the word preservation kind of means, you know, for the most part, some states have some different definitions of what they define preservation as. But for the most part, I mean, we're trying to implement these techniques um, and scope these techniques to avoid, you know, to form these actions before we get pavements uh, developing s s um, severe deterioration where we have to do something more extensive. So we want to do things up front, lower cost, uh, less intrusive and really try to keep that performance curve, that pavement performance curve we saw, which we have a photo of too here, um, high as long as we can before it starts dropping off and we have to do more extensive action. So again, focus on extending the life and restoring the functional condition of our pavements. Uh, certainly the benefit there, if we do things earlier up front, less intrusive, uh, they're going to be significant cost savings. I think Todd Miller showed you some slides the other day of some uh, A and B scenarios where doing things earlier and keeping the pavements, the good pavements in better condition was from an economic standpoint was actually better than trying to, you know, trying to balance things more and working on some pavements that were really farther, farther gone. So, uh, of course, we always want to improve pavement conditions, increase functional performance. I mean, there is a big emphasis on smoothness. We're all aware of that, certainly in our industry. Um, so a lot of what we're doing is to restore smoothness to the pavement, which is what our taxpayers and users, uh, um, um, the real emphasis to them is that they're riding, driving on a smooth pavement. Certainly safety and noise have become more important. Um, noise not as much, but certainly safety these days is, is uh, one of the top priorities of all the agencies is to make sure we have a good safe roadways out there. And reduce environmental impact. Certainly, if we can build a pavement, make it last 122 years without doing a whole lot to it from a sustainability um, aspect, environmental aspect, that's, that's, that's pretty good. I will tell you, we have some pavements in our two states that are 70 to 80 years old that are still in service concrete that we haven't done a whole lot to. So there's our pav pavement preservation window. You, you kind of saw this from the last presenter basically had the same slide. Um, you will see that on the p um, pavement preservation side, I think some of the some of the strategies in this guide extend a little far out farther out to the right. So when we talk about uh, full depth patching, uh, precast concrete pavement panels, which we'll show you, concrete overlays, we're really extending that curve out. Certainly, we're probably not going to do a concrete overlay on something that's in gr good condition that wouldn't be needed. So we're really kind of pushing that curve out to the right when we're still calling those preservation strategies. At least, at least in our two states, we might still categorize those as, as preservation type actions. Uh, and this goes for this slide as well. It says we really want to do our pavement preservation actions when we have lim limited structural problems, of course. Although when we do full that patching, precast panel um, replacement, I mean, really when we're doing those actions, typically we're doing them for structural reasons, not functional reasons. Um, no materials related distress. Uh, I think there is an emphasis now to look at some preservation strategies. Again, the concrete overlays, uh, the replacement strategies, which are a little more in depth. Um, but we can overlay pavements that have materials related distresses. Hopefully we correct that up front, but there's a lot of pavements out there already that we have to deal with. Um, but for the most part, a lot of the uh, less intrusive actions, we really want to do those up front when the pavement's still in good condition, make sure we keep it in as good a shape as we possibly can for the least, least cost. All right, so that original manual is um, out in 2008. Uh, it was updated last year in 2014. Uh, CP Tech Center up at Iowa State, they were the... Uh, spearheaded the effort here, uh, Dale Harrington with uh, Kurt Smith. Um, 
Pavement evaluation, there's a section up front that talks about evaluating your pavements. And really from a concrete standpoint, we really need to scope the right actions for the particular um, pavement or project that we're dealing with. So um, in some cases, you know, we're trying to, you know, I, you know, a lot, a, lot of, a lot of my job is actually going out, people call me and said, hey, I got issues, you know. I rarely get called up front or people don't call me out and say, hey, I got this great payment, can you come out and look at it? Because there's not much to see. They usually call me when there's some issue or the pavement's old and they want to know, you know, what can I do with it now? And a lot of times it's, you know, you get out there, it's a 50 year old pavement, basically they haven't touched it in 50 years and they want to know if they can rehab it. Well. You know, for the most part, a lot of those pavements are beyond the uh, certainly preservation type actions and are really more out in the heavier rehabilitation or replacement. So, um, so scoping the project's real important. There's a chapter on that. And then it goes through all the different treatments um, that we have available to us. And there's, and there's quite a few. We have a lot of actions we can perform on concrete pavements when, it, when they're needed. Uh, I think they have 13 state workshops held through 2014 and 2015 so far. So they're, they got a little traveling road show going around to the different agencies, uh, DOTs, performing workshops on the new guide. Uh, da, 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 nothing really, um, really what we're gonna talk about or we're gonna try to highlight is the things that have been updated. They have added a chapter on concrete overlays. Uh, and I know they've also, we got our precast panel folks in the audience here with the Fort Miller group. There's also some information on precast concrete panels. Uh, published in September last year, 2014. There's the technical, com technical committee developed the guide, FHWA, DOT folks, industry, academia, right? All right, just, you see the chapters there, introduction, pavement preservation, all the different strategies. Um, we'll kind of skip that in the interest of time here. Common treatments that you're probably aware of. Um, we do a fair amount of concrete paving in our two states here in, in the Midwest and a lot of states around the Midwest. So we're pretty familiar with these techniques. Full depth repairs, pretty simple there. Dowel bar retrofits, diamond grinding, partial depth repairs, joint sealing. Growing treatments, we do a lot of cross stitching. Cross stitching is really uh, inexpensive. Um, less intrusive type of action that really does a great job for longitudinal cracking, if you do have some. Thin concrete overlays. Uh, slab stabilization, that was bigger. We don't do near as much of that probably as we used to. Um, and retrofit edge drains. Um, we do a little bit of that, but that's not, not, not very common either. But it is available if you have moisture issues for a particular uh, project or application. Partial depth repairs, I think you know what we're talking about here. We're trying to replace, um, if we have type, some type of surface distress, we're trying to replace the surface of the concrete. Um, usually two to three inches deep, third the depth of the slab if we have an issue, a spall, a joint spall, um, spalling around cracking, whatever it may be, we're gonna do, um, scope one of these partial depth repairs. And when we're done, what we wanna do is basically have one monolithic piece of concrete left. Uh, when we're done. So we're gonna, you see from the slide there, we're basically, the way we've done these in the past is we're gonna saw around the boundaries, jackhammer the existing unsound material out, get that surface really nice and clean, right? Because the trick to these is little audience participation. When we glue two things together, what do we need to do? Anybody? What was that? Cleanliness, Cleanliness that's one increase the surface area too, right? Whenever we bond, glue two things together, we wanna to make sure we have as much surface area as we can and we gotta get it super clean so we get those surfaces to bond together. Because we don't want it to bond together for just a year or two, we want it to bond together for the life of the, of the patch, hopefully 12 to 15 year fix here we're talking about. Um, I think the advancements here, are the things that have been added to this, and this is one of the techniques that has really grown um, in use, we've done a lot of this around here, um, is really using, instead of doing, um, the way we've done this in the past is a lot of those smaller patches, sawing the boundaries, jackhammering it out, very labor intensive, really drives up the cost of these patches on a square yard basis. Um, we've really moved to these milling machines now, we're using automated machinery now to remove the concrete. Two things that does for you, one, we're going away from the vertical edge 
concept. The old concept was you need that vertical edge, that saw edge um, for these patches to perform. What we're finding out, I mean, if you think about it, that edge now is nice and smooth, so trying to bond to that doesn't seem to make a lot of sense. Um, plus it's vertical, so all your stresses are in that plane. Now if we come in with a milling machine and we're now more at a, let's say a 45 degree angle with a roughened surface, you get a much better chance of getting bond there. So, plus going to this milling machine operation, your limit, I got five minutes left? All right, so we'll move along. Um, going to this milling machine has dropped the cost of these patches by a half to two thirds. So there's that much savings in labor for these. All right, so you see there, milling machine. There's an example we've also gone to, instead of um, doing a partial depth patch, skipping two feet because it looks good, doing another partial depth patch, we set the milling machine down and we just go. Because you know you're gonna be back in three or four years fixing those areas in between anyway. So just set the miller down, do the whole joint. In the long run, it saves you a lot of money. All right. Full depth repairs, I think everybody understands that. Noth nothing new here other than the precast panels. Um, we'll mention that. A lot of experience with precast panels. We've done jobs in Missouri. We're also doing a job here in Kansas up by Fort Leavenworth right now is ongoing. Um, so I did add Kansas in there, but uh, certainly something that's becoming a lot more common in the high volume uh, urban areas is going to the uh, precast panels. All right, utility cuts repairs. That's in there in the guide. I'm gonna move through this dowel bar retrofit. Not a lot there other than focusing on the uh, durability and the shrinkage of the backfill uh, patch material that we're using. But we've had a lot of success with DBR in our two states here locally. Cross stitching, like I said, it's kind of like a sewing stitch operation. If you have a longitudinal crack, you wanna catch it before the crack starts to open up horizontally or vertically. But basically what you're doing is you're sewing or tying the crack back together works really well. Diamond grinding, I think we're familiar with that. Um, it says boom to concrete. I think maybe boom to concrete. I wasn't sure what the word they were looking for there, but I'm gonna go with boom to concrete preser pavement preservation. So basically we can do all these uh, preservation and repair techniques and then we can go in basically at the end and restore our smoothness uh, to the pavement. So the diamond grinding has been a, a godsend to us and really does a great job at the end providing that smooth ride for the users. We have a bunch of different surface textures available now for different applications. Conventional stuff you see there, the corduroy texture. There's a city street grind available for doing more residential type lower speed streets. There's a texture grind to restore um, texture from a skid resistant safety aspect. And then there's the next generation surface texture, which you see there, which basically removes those corduroy fins. And so now you have kind of a, a conventional diamond grinding and a grooving operation together. We've, we've, we've done this. Um, I know we've done this on I-70 in Kansas and it works really great. If you want a super quiet pavement, that's the surface for you right there, if that's important. Thin concrete overlays, like I said, this really goes beyond maybe preservation from the um, it's a little more extensive type of operation where your pavement's a little farther, you know, along in the deterioration process. You see bonded ones there. I'll tell you the bonded ones are real tricky. So um, for my money, if you can look to the unbonded ones, I think you're a lot better off. So, but the bonded ones usually probably two to four inches. Two is about the minimum, up to four. Uh, unbondeds, we're doing a lot of four to six inch unbondeds now. Um, and then for a heavier type, if you're really almost redesigning the pavement, use an overlay strategy, we're gonna go six, seven, eight, 10, 12, whatever it may be for the traffic. All right, what's new? Uh, increased importance placed on pavement management system, the concrete overlays, updated equipment technology, the non-destructive testing, GPR, MIT scan, MIRA, uh, those partial depth repair techniques with the milling machine, ASR initiatives, um, from the Federal Highway has been spending a lot of time on ASR, uh, how, to, how to handle that on pavements that have ASR and exhibiting, starting to exhibit this distress, precast repairs, utility cuts, uh, continuously reinforced concrete pavements if you have those in your state, uh, and an emphasis on um, noise or uh, controlling the, the um, vehicle pavement noise 
uh, interaction there through the different grinding techniques. All right, implementation stuff. Here's some upcoming workshops scheduled for around the country. You see there a lot here coming up the next few months. Uh, there's web-based training. I'm not sure if these are actually available yet or these are in the works. So, uh, uh, but there is some NHI web-based training um, available for the new guide. There's also a CP Tech Center has all their publications are available for free download. So if you go to cptechcenter.org, you can get all these documents. Um, there are some sister documents. So if you want to know more about a particular repair application, there's documents specific to that if you really want more detail. But all that stuff's out there on the website or you can always call myself or the concrete pavement rep in uh, your state and we'll get that stuff for you. And then there's also some training courses. Again, not sure if these are actually available yet through the NCPP, some online web-based training um, involving the guide here. So there's the different kind of modules that are available to you. So you can do your own type of web-based training if you want on your own time. That's all I have. Any questions? I'll be around for a while here this morning. So Todd. Yes, uh, the question was about the work schedule and the workshops. Uh, uh, we actually did one in Missouri. I don't know. Maybe it's been back in the 2008. I kind of lose track of time. But certainly, um, if you'd like to schedule one of those workshops, certainly contact your myself here, Kansas and Missouri, but your concrete pavement rep. Uh, or you can call me even in your other state if you don't have a rep. Um, you can always call me and I'll put you in touch with the right person, but we're happy to schedule those. Any other questions? All right, thank you.